Okay, so today we're going to talk about the applications of machine learning for cybersecurity. I'm Vahid Behzadon, I'm a PhD candidate in the East Coast Lab at Kansas State University, and I'll be your presenter for today's lecture. So let's go over some basics first. Let's go over the security jargon. Um, many of you come from a cybersecurity background and are already familiar with uh, the jargon and the vocabulary and the terminology, but let's go over it just to be on the safe side, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, the security objectives are traditionally categorized or identified through the CIA triangle, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and to some extent, non-repudiation. Confidentiality refers to the desire or the demand to keep information confidential. What does that mean? Only authorized personnel or authorized users can access a certain kind of information. Integrity refers to the integrity of operation. So the function and the operation and the process of uh, a certain uh, program or a certain operation needs to go as planned, as intended. If anything happens that changes this process or this flow and brings on undesired states, the integrity of uh, the integrity aspect of that operation has been compromised. Availability refers to the fact that we want the service, the process, the operation to be available when needed. So denial of service attacks are attacks on availability because they either uh, affect the quality of service or completely take the service down. And non-repudiation? Well, we need to know who is responsible for uh, a certain action or a certain effect. Like if you change your username or change your password in a networked account, the admins of that network or uh, system need to know that it was you that has changed the password, that have changed the password. So uh, this can also be seen as a privacy concern, but since this isn't the topic of our talk today, we aren't going to go too deep into this one. Now let's talk about some basic terminology. We know what threats are. Uh, the literal translation is very close to the technical meaning, which is potential violation of a security objective. The key word here is potential. A threat is a potential violation of a security objective. It's not necessarily being acted upon. It's not necessarily being exploited yet. It just exists. There's a vulnerability there, and that vulnerability can be exploited towards violation of one of the uh, confidentiality, integrity, availability dimensions of the security objectives. That's a threat. Security refers to protection from intentional threats. An attack is intentional violation of a security goal. Once again, the keyword here is intentional. If something goes wrong unintentionally, it's a bug, but not necessarily a security issue. So what are the security mechanisms? Um, let's define two basic terms first. Policy, uh, you might have heard of it in terms of IDS intrusion detection policy or authentication policy or password policy and such is a statement of what is and what is not allowed. Mechanism in the context of uh, security operations means or refers to methods for enforcing a security policy. Now, what are different strategies to provide security? Generally, from a very high level, there are three main strategies. One is prevention. So prevention refers to detection and mitigation of potential violations before they happen. Identify threats and try to prevent them before deployment or before hacking, like during the design and development of a software system. 
Examples of prevention are encryption, authentication, and uh, secure design paradigms and frameworks. Then, uh, we all know that prevention is not 100% guaranteed in many cases due to the complexity of software, so there's a need for detection. Let's say that there is a threat out there that can be exploited but has not been prevented because it was not known or it was not feasible to implement a prevention mechanism. Then comes in the detection phase or strategy. Uh, we need to know as security operators, as people responsible for the security, we need to know whether an intrusion or compromise has happened. Uh, what are different means of detection? Well, malware scanners or malware uh, detectors, intrusion detection systems, firewalls, to some extent firewalls and such. And then we have the analysis phase. Let's say that an attack has happened and it's all been done. Now it's time to do some forensics to find out what went wrong and try to prevent or mitigate further attacks or compromises of the same type. So once again, the security mechanisms or general strategies for security are threefold. Prevention, detection, and analysis. But as I said, prevention is not enough. Uh, for those of us who work in the cybersecurity field, we know that new security vulnerabilities are discovered every day. If you go to exploit-db.com, you'll see a lot of new exploits going public, and that's, once again, public exploits or public reports of vulnerabilities. You can check uh, uh, security catalogs or vulnerability catalogs online, which are being updated at an increasing rate. And again, we're talking about public repositories. There are always O days or zero days, which are vulnerabilities and exploits that are not public, but they are out there. And there are a lot of them every day. So this means that as hard as one may try, it's not possible to provide a 100% guarantee through prevention that nothing will go wrong in terms of security. Um, this slide is a little outdated, uh, but it still uh, gives you a good insight into what's going on. We know that SSL, in different forms of it, is very widely used and deployed in the internet ecosystem or networking ecosystem in general. Back in 2014, two hugely uh, consequential bugs were found, security uh, vulnerabilities were found in two SSL implementations. The Apple SSL implementation, which was labeled the go-to fail bug, and then the Heartbleed, the infamous Heartbleed bug, which was found in Open SSL back in uh, April 2014. And a more interesting example is a Shellshock bug, which was found in Bash. This bug was, if I recall correctly, in the system for decades but was not discovered until 2014 and it was exploited heavily in the wild uh, back then. It was a huge issue. You can see that even systems that have been out there for decades may still contain vulnerabilities that were not fully identified or prevented by those who develop and maintain them. So the key point here is prevention is not always enough. Also, we know that the attacks are on the rise. Back in 2015, there's an estimate that about 500 million identities were exposed. For Americans, uh, the exposure of their social security number is the equivalent of uh, exposing your bank accounts, banking information, your insurance information, credit card information, your social security number is literally your everything in the US. Uh, more recently, I think it was back in 2017, last year, there was the Equifax breach, which led to the exposure of uh, about 200 million, 180 million social security numbers uh, and uh, corresponding profiles in the wild. And that's a huge data breach. Their uh, repercussions are still going on, and a lot of people are not fully safe fully uh, protected against identity th theft here in the US. Other than data breaches, there are cases of cybercrime 
Well, this year, in 2018, and back in 2017, ransomware were on the rise. Uh, so the way that ransomware works is it finds a vulnerability in your operating system. It exploits that vulnerability to install an encryption software, which encrypts your data and then asks you for money so that they can provide you with a key to decrypt your data and uh, have access to them again. Uh, ransomware is still a huge problem and we know that it's on the rise because it works. Another instance is crypto mining or crypto jacking where the vulnerabilities are exploited to install software that uses your processing power, your computer's processing power to mine uh, cryptocurrencies. And another instance which is also on the rise is cyber warfare. What's cyber warfare? It's a type of attacks or cyber attacks targeting the infrastructure, the industry, uh, government entities, and also political activists. Examples of infrastructure are power grids and smart grids. Examples of industry are, uh, well, let's say a defense company or a tech company uh, being attacked by a nation state uh, for the purpose of stealing intellectual property. This has happened quite a lot in the past few years, but in the past year particularly, this was a huge issue in the cybersecurity domain. Attacking governments, uh, attacking government websites for political purposes or attacking government infrastructure, e-government to essentially cripple all electronic activities related to government. And attacking activists is when a uh, nation state attacks political activists in, uh, within their own nation or another nation for political purposes. And a very good example, uh, the golden example of cyber warfare was Stuxnet, which was a malware detected in 2010 and it was designed to disrupt the nuclear centrifuges uh, in Iran through industrial control systems. It was very sophisticated, both in terms of the way it was delivered into the air gap network and the exploitation mechanism. Stuxnet contained multiple zero days, which is a good indicator that it was developed by a well-financed entity, most probably a government. Uh, there are further details available on this. If you're interested, you can watch uh, uh, a documentary called Zero Days to gain a better insight into Stuxnet. But there is still another attack surface that has not been widely or even narrowly covered in cybersecurity, and that's attacking artificial intelligence. We know that AI-based systems are on the rise, like say self-driving cars, Tesla's autopilot is a good example. Unmanned aerial vehicles are uh, growingly dependent on AI for detection and navigation and uh, monitoring. Smart technologies like IoT, smart home, and uh, even to some extent smart grids are more dependent, are growingly dependent on AI-based techniques. And physical security is, of course, another instance where uh, biometric systems, CCTV face recognition and all that are based on AI. But as it happens, there are fundamental as well as emergent vulnerabilities in AI and machine learning techniques as well. Um, I do have another lecture on this topic. I've covered it in other talks. You can look it up. I don't think I'll record the next lecture for this particular series for OWASP. Uh, but you can find a similar talk on uh, vulnerabilities of artificial intelligence on my website, www.vbehzadan.com. Now, back to ML or machine learning for cybersecurity. So we said that the number of vulnerabilities is increasing. Uh, is it just increasing in quantity? No. Novel attacks, attacks of types that are previously unseen or unknown, 
are on the rise. And there's also a much higher diversity in malicious software. So these two combined means that more effort needs to be put into detecting attacks and detecting attack signatures. There's also a growing uh, or increasing complexity in the type of cyber systems or cyber physical systems that may be of interest to cyber criminals and attackers. Like when we talk about IoT, the Internet of Things, we're talking about a distributed system of heterogeneous devices following different protocols and uh, running different types of software. This is a complex system and analyzing complex systems is very difficult. So what huge bottleneck in security analysis and maintenance in uh, the current day and age is the fact that it is mostly based on human analysis. So currently what happens is a human being, a guy like me or a, a security professional sitting somewhere in a lab, spends his time on manual discovery of vulnerabilities on manual generation of attack signatures and on manual analysis of attacks and malware. Um, all of these tasks are very, very intensive in terms of the amount of effort required, the amount of time required, and with the growing uh, complexity of the systems and diversity of attacks, it's becoming more and more difficult. So, uh, well, us human beings, we are limited we are not uh our brains cannot work with infinite speed there's a limit to how much we can do in a day that's why human analysis is a bottleneck in dealing with the growing number of vulnerabilities a solution that has been proposed and lobbied for in the past few years is automation of these processes through intelligent security systems what do we mean by intelligent security systems we refer to the application of machine learning in cybersecurity for facilitation or total automation of prevention, detection, and analysis. So what we mean here is that we want to use machine learning to do part or all of the job that a human analyst used to do. What are the challenges involved here? We'll talk about this in more detail towards the end of this presentation, but it's important to note that the efficiency, as in how effective the machine learning uh, algorithm or technique applied is, because if it's not effective, it's a waste of time and it can lead to uh, threats remaining undiscovered or f a huge amount of false positives. Efficiency is the same. Robustness means that they should be able to adapt different types of attacks or different uh, conditions for which they are designed. And also, this is a very interesting to note, such machine learning systems must be controllable and transparent. What do we mean by controllable? Well, machine learning is where machine learns to do something on our behalf. We need to make sure that what it learns is actually what we want it to learn. And if it does something else or learns a mechanism that's not fully aligned with what we want it to do, we need to be able to modify the actions that it takes or the decisions that it takes. That's controllability. And transparency means that we need to know how it works. Right now, we are not fully sure how some machine learning models like deep neural networks work. That's why uh, we need to have some means of uh, provide some means of transparency in machine learning systems to make sure they've learned something sensible. Now, let's talk about machine learning in more details. Machine learning, the dictionary definition for machine learning, is the theory and practice of making computers learn. In other words, we're talking about automatic inference of patterns and dependencies from data. Um, a very important aspect in machine learning is generalization. So, let's say that we have a system, a machine learning system or model, whose job is to detect uh, or convert handwritten words and letters into type letters. Back in the day, we used to call these systems OCRs or optical character recognition systems. Uh, 
If it learns based on samples provided by a single person's handwriting, it may not be able to recognize uh, someone else's handwriting of the same word because everyone else uh, has uh, has their own have their own handwriting or writing style. Generalization means finding the basic or fundamental features in different or diverse types of samples that represent the entire set of data. Like all of us can read different handwritings to some extent. There's something in common between the way I write the word, the letter L, and the way everyone else writes the letter L. And the machine learning system needs to find what that common feature or set of features is between uh, different handwritings. And that's what we call generalization. Now, uh, let's keep going. Uh, into the definition of machine learning. Machine learning is learned from observations. Uh, and it's very different in this regards from uh, procedural code. In procedural code, you write a very exact algorithm with a set of if-then-else statements. You say, if this happens, you have to do that. But in machine learning, what happens is the algorithm learns those conditions, those if statements, implicitly. You don't have to explicitly uh, explicitly note those if statements. All of those if statements, all of those features, will features and processes will be learned based on observations. Um, and it's a, another interesting definition of machine learning is the intersection of computer science with the statistics because when we talk about learning from observations we're talking about the statistical inference we're looking at the statistics in the data to uh, gain some insight or learn a certain pattern in the data set that we are observing or the model is observing now here's an interesting example of how these two are different so richard dawkins one of my favorite authors writes in the book uh, Se the selfish gene i believe that our brains uh, contain a module or at least contain or perform the functionality of solving a number of differential equations to find out or plan on how to follow and catch a ball but it turns out that there's actually no uh, differential equation being solved in our brains. What's happening is our brains learned a very simple heuristic called the gaze heuristic. And this heuristic goes like this. Fix, the, fix your eye on the ball, start running, and adjust your running until the angle of gaze remains constant. That's how you follow a ball. That's how easy it is. And machine learners machine learning models uh, learn this sort of heuristics based on either experience or observation. Now let's look at the similarities between natural learning and machine learning. Uh, for those of us who play musical instruments like the guitar, we know that when we want to learn a new song, learn to play a new song, we start by uh, playing something that doesn't really sound like a new song but through exercise practice we calibrate the way our fingers move on the fretboard and we calibrate uh, the way that the music progresses until it becomes uh, at least audibly similar to what we want to play uh, other examples are learning to walk and learning to ride a bike it's important to note that all of these instances have something in common syntactically these are all verbs Riding a bike, playing the guitar, uh, or walking. All of these are verbs. And verbs in the mathematical domain are called functions. So in some sense, machine learning is learning certain functions, or in other words, function approximation. Um, note this down somewhere. Uh, it will help you... Uh, get a better understanding of or a deeper understanding of what machine learning is all about later on. Now let's talk about the toy example. Let's say that we want to train or teach a machine learning model 
to recognize apples and pears from each other. Let's say we give it the features of an apple and it should be able to recognize that it's an apple and not a pear and vice versa. So, uh, what's the input here? The input is usually determined by the designer of the model. In this specific case, the designer decided to uh, represent apples and pears with two-dimensional data, color and height of fruit. So what's the color of the fruit and what's the height of the fruit, the geometric height of the fruit? Is this enough? We don't know, but this is what we have to work with. And what's the output? It's a prediction, whether it's apple or pear. Now, uh, a little bit more into terminology, the input domain X is called the data. And it's the representation of objects used for learning. Uh, a classic input domain is e representing data or objects through vectors. I believe that most of you know what vectors are, and I'm not going to go into that, but if you're not familiar with it, you can just Google it and figure out the exact definition of vectors. Uh, other ways of representing objects or uh, instances of real-world phenomenon that we want to feed into our model are strings of characters, images, trees, graphs. But in the end, I believe that all, or at least almost all, of the objects that we can or want to feed to a model can be represented through vectors. And the output domain is usually called the labels uh, is a property of objects to learn and predict. A classic output domain is two classes, whether a certain input uh, belongs to class one or it doesn't. Other output types are ranks, categories, scores, and all that. Now, let's talk about training data. Training data in supervised learning, which we'll define in a couple of slides, are tuples of objects and labels. So x1 and y1, let's talk about x1 first, in the example of apples and pears, the classic part for apples and pears, x1 can be the color and the height of an apple, and y1 is the label associated with it, the correct label. Let's say it's app, uh, just apple. And x2 can be the color and height of an instance of a pair. And then y2 is a label pair. Note that labels are not needed in all settings. We'll go into the more details of this statement in a couple of slides. Um, and the idea is to do prediction on test data. How's test data different from training data? Well, test data is unseen or unknown objects. We're talking about generalization that we talked about before. So our model needs to learn the features, the fundamental features, the kernel features that represent all types of apples and pears, regardless of sing singular instances, so that we can apply our models to unseen data. Now, what can we learn? We can learn, learning is inference of functional dependencies from data. How's Y dependent on X? How's the output or the label dependent on the input? Uh, dependencies can be described by a learning model, theta, which parameterizes a prediction function, f which takes the input data or maps the input data to the correct label. Now let's look into a simple linear model. Uh, let's say that our model is described by the set of parameters Q, W1, W2, and B, and the function that we choose, it's important to note that we've chosen this format, the function that we choose to represent this classification task between apples and pears is a linear one. So it's x1 times w1 plus x2 times w2 plus b. The idea in 
machine learning is to find the correct or most suitable W1, W2, and B. W1 can be a vector or matrix, W2 is the same, and B is usually a bias or uh, just a vector. We want to find the best values for W1, W2, and B so that the amount of error in classification using FQ, F sub Q, is minimized. Now, um, let's talk about discriminative versus generative models. Discriminative learning models provide or do modeling of prediction functions only. So the idea is for these models to discriminate between different classes of objects. And discrimination is often easier than descrip uh, description. So examples of discriminative models are support vector machines, neural networks, and such. Uh, but generative models, on the other hand, model the underlying concepts, and they are capable of generating samples. So let's say we have a limited sample set of, uh, I don't know, apples and pears, but we need more samples to train a bigger a more sophisticated supervised learning model. For that purpose, we can use a generative learning model, which has learned the basic or fundamental characteristics and features of the objects, like apples and pears, and is capable of producing more samples based on those fundamental characteristics. Examples include naive Bayes hidden Markov uh, models, and also generative adversarial networks, which use neural networks. Um, this is a very interesting topic and I encourage you to look more into generative models later on when you have a very small data set and you need more data to train a sophisticated let's say deep learning model you can use generative models to generate or produce more samples for that purpose. Now what's the learning process like? The learning process is essentially searching the space of possible models, all possible models. Uh, in our previous linear model, it's searching the space of all possible configurations or values of W1, W2, and B, so that we can find a good learning model for prediction. Now, let's talk about two different types of learning. You've probably heard about supervised learning and unsupervised learning, but what do they mean? Supervised learning is when we have the correct label, when we, ha when we know what the correct output is for a subset of data, which we call training data. And the idea is to learn a mapping between uh, input data and output data, or input data, uh, or the vector representation of input data and the correct labels. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, is when you don't have the correct labels, you don't know what the correct output is, and the idea is to learn some underlying structure within uh, the function or, with, or within the data. So in supervised learning, in other words, you know what you're looking for, you have the correct labels for a subset of input data, but in unsupervised learning, you don't know what you're looking for. There's also semi-supervised learning and transductive learning where you have some labeled data, some labeled instances of data, but uh, the other uh, instances are unlabeled. That's called hybrid or semi-supervised learning. There's also reinforcement learning, which is not covered in these lectures. I have a series of uh, lectures dedicated to reinforcement learning. You can look it up on my YouTube channel or website later on. We aren't going to go into the details of uh, reinforcement learning now, but just be aware that there is a third class of learning called reinforcement learning, which is based on direct interaction with the environment and gaining rewards uh, based on how well your action or the action is uh, in certain circumstances. Um, Okay, so a prominent instance of supervised learning is classification. 
which is learning to categorize objects into classes. Like the instance, uh, the example we've been working with so far, classifying apples and pears, or classifying inputs into apples and pears. So the idea is uh, discrimination, it's a discriminative model, discrimination of objects using learning. Uh, the output domain is often uh, within whether it's in a certain class or not, minus one or plus one, or uh, whether it's in class one, class two, class three, and so on. Examples of s classification in cybersecurity is spam filtering in emails. This is one of the oldest applications of machine learning in cybersecurity and intrusion detection, whether a certain kind of activity should be classified as uh, an intrusion or compromise or not. Common algorithms for classification are support vector machines, K near nearest neighbors, uh, neural networks, and so on. Um, let's look into a more relevant example, classification for intrusion detection. So the idea is to discriminate between benign and malicious activity. Uh, let's say that we have a certain uh, TCP or actually an HTTP uh, request. Uh, it starts with a typical GET request and what you look uh, what you're looking at here is this particular person percent 35c attack i think this is from the nimda worm if i'm not mistaken this is a very old vulnerability in iis so if you put back then if you put this certain percent percent 35c uh in the url box you could skip the boundaries of well, the web server and access files uh outside the web route so you want to make sure that this is you want to be able to recognize this pattern or this type of attack and for that you can classify requests uh, in malicious and benign classes so if something contains a weird character set like percent c1 percent af in the URL or the get address you the classifier will classify it as malicious uh, and otherwise it can be benign another example of supervised learning is regression which is learning to predict a numerical property or score um, it's essentially approximation of an observed function by uh, learning a model and the output domain is usually the domain of real numbers. Examples are temperature forecasting, stock market prediction, and so on. And some of the good uh, or well-known uh, algorithms used for regression analysis or regression modeling are logistic regression and ridge regression. Now let's talk about unsupervised learning. A very good example or a very well-known example of unsupervised learning techniques is clustering, which is essentially the grouping of similar objects into clusters. You can contrast it to classification, where clusters are not known at the start. There is no ground truth. You don't know what the correct answer is. And the output domain is usually the number of permutation or the number of clusters found and the location of objects within those clusters. Uh, examples are comparisons of two species. Let's say we have data on apples and pears, and if we cluster them together, you'll see that red apples and red pears of the same size uh, fall within the same cluster. Green apples and green pears of the same size fall within another cluster, and yellow ones form another cluster. And you can see that the clustering here was mostly based on color. We didn't tell the clustering algorithm to cluster based on color, but it learned to do so based on uh, its observation or the data that was available. Uh, a very good example in cybersecurity is malware analysis, where you want to cluster similar malware together 
uh, to enhance or facilitate analysis. Some common learning algorithms for clus clustering are k-means clustering, linkage clustering, and so on. Now, let's look at an application of clustering into uh, in cybersecurity. The instance here is network payloads for, we want to cluster network payloads for later analysis. And the idea is to group similar payloads together or cluster them together. So those uh, requests in our previous example, if there is a GET request that uh, calls for or contains cmd.exe in the URL or some other feature, they can be clustered into uh, attack type C. If there is, let's say, a, a SQL injection or such in the request, it can be clustered within attack type Y, and then attack type X is a different type of uh, malicious activity. Um, another instance of unsupervised learning is anomaly detection, which is a detection of deviations from learned uh, models of normality. It can be generative or discriminative models, uh, but both are models of normality. What's normal in the data? The domain is the domain of output is usually zero or one, or between zero or one. How weird, how abnormal, how anomalous is the data com uh, considering uh, the general distribution of the data seen so far? Examples of applications are engine failure detection, detecting whether an engine, uh, a car engine, has failed or not, and cybersecurity intrusion detection. Does uh, this activity look anomalous or not? If it does, then we have to look into it. If not, let let it pass. Some common algorithms for anomaly detection are mean or one class uh, support vector machines. Now let's dive deeper into applications of machine learning in cybersecurity. One uh, venue of applications are is that of detection of attacks. A traditional approach for attack detection is based on signature analysis and signature detection. Like if there is a percent %c1% percent %9c in the URL or the GET request, uh, this usually corresponds to a certain type of exploits uh, used in name the worm and other types of attacks. So whenever you see this percent %c1, percent %9c, you know that this attack is happening. This is called a signature for that attack. But it's ineffective against novel and unknown attacks because you don't really know the signature of a zero-day exploit or zero-day attack. There's an inherent delay to availability of novel signatures. So when an O-Day is exploited in the wild, it takes some time for security analysts to find the signature or a set of signatures for those attacks. And this causes a delay. And the analysis is usually obstructed uh, nowadays with uh, ways of confusing or slowing down analysis, like polymorphism and obfuscation. Um, now, now, if you want to uh, use machine learning for this particular purpose, intrusion detection, one way is to use anomaly detection. How anomalous is the payload of a TCP packet or a GET request? And uh, accordingly, if something is anomalous or has a very high anomaly score, you can flag it and pass it on for further analysis or automatically block it. It depends on the policy set in the intrusion detection system. Uh, another application is malware analysis. So manual investigation of new malware, as in a human professional sitting down and investigating new malware, is very, very inefficient these days because there are thousands of novel malware detected every day. There is a wide variety of behavior, malware behavior, like uh, botnets, trojans, crypto miners, ransomware, and so on. Uh, 
and manual analysis and crafting of signatures for all of those in a timely manner is uh, well effectively impossible so for this purpose uh, one of the approaches, one of the machine learning approaches to alleviate the bottleneck here is to use behavioral clustering. When a new malware is found, a clustering algorithm can be applied to see what type of malware is, uh, is it closest to. Is it a botnet? Is it acting like a botnet? If so, then we'll classify it or cluster it with other botnets and reduce the analysis time. Uh, is it a crypto miner? We'll cluster it with crypto miners and so on. Another interesting uh, aspect is vulnerability discovery. So typically uh, and traditionally vulnerability discovery is very tedious. It requires time and expertise. Like looking at uh, all of this code here, finding out a certain buffer over overflow vulnerability is going to take a lot of time. And sometimes you have to look into machine code. Sometimes you have to look into the complex structure and interactions of different components in the system. So finding vulnerabilities in a timely manner and an efficient manner is very tedious and inefficient. So one way to go about this problem is to use a machine learning technique called dimensionality reduction, which reduces the dimensions of the problem to a tractable set. What do I mean by dimensions? The number of features that you look into, like looking at function calls or looking at uh, procedural traces. It can be very cumbersome. So. We only look at certain traces, certain types of traces, or certain function calls instead of looking at all of those. Or sometimes dimensionality reduction projects all of those, all of the redundant dimensions into combos that don't necessarily make perfect sense to a human user, but is easier for a machine learning model to analyze with uh, considering the computational constraints. But with all of these applications that we talked about, uh, and one that we haven't talked about, which is threat intelligence. I'll hopefully prepare another presentation on that for you guys. Uh, we need to note that cybersecurity is not the usual machine learning domain. Some of the challenges here are, well, the semantic gaps. What is actually learn? What do we, well, how do we represent problems? And how do we represent solutions? There are operational constraints. Like, what happens if the machine learning model uh, is not 100% accurate, which is almost always the uh, case? What is the cost of false positives or false negatives? It can be very high, and thus that machine learning uh, model can be rendered useless or infeasible. And there's a need for transparency. Uh, why does the model does what it does? Why does it work? Is it doing something weird? Has it learned a type of heuristic that doesn't exactly work in uh, certain conditions? These are some of the things that are challenging in designing machine learning models for uh, cybersecurity. Current trends, uh, well, deep learning is still huge. Uh, because it automates feature learning, you don't have to a hand pick the set of features that represent the objects, data, or events. You can just feed it raw data through some vector representation and will learn, uh, a deep learning model will learn the best set of features that represent uh, those objects and events automatically. There's also threat intelligence, which is a combination of data mining and pattern analysis using uh, neural nets or other types of uh, machine learning models. There is a, usually a huge amount of natural language processing involved here, especially when uh, open source threat intelligence is uh, the focus. Deep reinforcement learning is one of my favorite subfields of machine learning, and it's being used to automate policy definition. I haven't actually seen a paper on this yet, but this is definitely a feasible way to go. And I haven't, uh, when there isn't a paper, I don't think there is a commercial uh, implementation yet. So you guys can 
uh, go through my reinforcement learning lectures and deep reinforcement learning lecture it's a uh, last one of the four and see whether you can put this idea to use in uh, in your framework and your uh, summer project and if you want to learn more if you want to look into more resources you can uh, well first and foremost believe in Google and Google uh, machine learning for cybersecurity you can find loads of resources but one curated list of good resources is available at www.covert.io and you can look into it for deeper and further and wider understanding of machine learning for cybersecurity so to summarize the lecture there are some of the current challenges in cybersecurity are the in increasing automa uh, automatization of attacks and malware, massive amounts of novel mali malicious code and attack types, and thus manual analysis is often ineffective or practically impossible. As a solution, machine learning uh, is being widely adopted to, for the purpose of adaptive defenses using learning algorithms and automatic detection and analysis of threats. Very well, thank you very much. If you have any questions, just let me know on the Slack channel or send me an email and I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as possible.